All right, what is up traders? What's up tycoons? Super excited for today's video. Important stuff we need to talk about. All right, now the first chart that we're going to be looking at is the yield curve. Now everyone talks about the yield curve to you, uh, but they don't seem to stress the important parts, all right, in my opinion. And we're going to take a look at the 10 year three month yield curve as well, but we're going to start off here. Now, this green and red line is going to be a yield curve. The purple line is going to be the Fed funds rate. And down here, we have the S&P 500 index, your SPX. Now, why is this so important right now? What do you need to know, right? These are the questions that you may be asking. Well, the first thing that I want to highlight to you, okay, is these vertical lines, right? And these are when the yield curve uninverts, okay? So the, the yellow line here is zero. Below zero means it is inverted. Uh, after it uninverts and it goes back to regular, has been highlighted the past two times right here. Okay, with those vertical lines. Now, what else do you see? Well, you see the purple line, which is the Fed funds rate. These flat periods here, these are pauses. Okay, so those are pauses. And when you see it go down, that's when you see cuts. And that's when you see cuts. So what do you see from the chart right now? Right. Well, if you're having some trouble processing it, rate cuts, right? So rate cuts, the purple line going down, does not happen until the yield curve is uninverted. All right. And that's very common to see. So right now, the market has been pricing in, you know, too many rate cuts, if you ask my opinion. But the thing about rate cuts is that rate cuts happen much, much quicker than rate hikes. OK, they're going to cut rates at a very rapid pace whenever they cut them. All right. Um, but what we see here, OK, is that the rate cuts do not happen until after the yield curve uninverts typically. Right now, we did have this period here where the yield curve did not uninvert because it never went inverted, okay? But if you take a look, right, and you look at when the rate cut started, it was very close to that zero line, and that's when we saw an uptrend uh, in the yield curve, all right? And that's when we start to saw uh, the, the rate cuts themselves. So, you know, if we take a look right here, we can see that we're in the pause period right now, right? We're at this pause period here. Okay, just like we were here and just like we were here, uh, but the yield curve is still down here. So the yield curve is going to have to get back to zero and above zero. Uh, and that's historically when we start to see rate cuts. Okay, so, you know, if you're ever looking for some type of timing mechanism or something like that, uh, the yield curve is what you're going to want to pay attention to. Now, the other thing I want to highlight is look at the performance of the S&P 500 of the stock market after the yield curve is uninverted and after we get the rate cuts, right? So we see rate cuts here, we see yield curve uninverted right here. And what do we see in the stock market? Big move down here. We see yield curve uninverted, we see Fed rate cut. And what do we see? Big move down in the stock market. So this is gonna be very important, okay? And it doesn't have to play out how it's done in the past, okay? Just because the yield curve uninverts and just because the Fed cut rates doesn't mean that the stock market has to crash. But if we were to take a look at past performance, uh, we can see that it's led to a crash, right? This is your 10 year, three month. This is also another very important yield curve, one that doesn't get looked at as much, okay? And you can see this is also very far away uh, from, you know, uh, uninverting, right? From getting back above zero. So, you know, you need to pay attention to this stuff. Now, in the meantime, global markets have been absolutely ripping, okay? What we've got here, may look like a mess, may look like some weird looking spaghetti. All it is, is your major markets across the globe, all right? So we've got things like France, Italy, Germany in here, okay? We've got US tech in here. Uh, you've got India, okay? We've got the Nifty 50 in there, the Nifty 500. We've got Brazil in here. Uh, many, many countries across the globe are extremely bullish over the past year, right? 2023 was a great year uh, for markets across the entire world, not just the US stock market, okay? So it's not like everything is completely bearish right now, okay? Uh, it's it's more so the opposite, right? Things were extremely bullish over the past year and heading into 2024. You have to keep in mind that, you know, oftentimes what was the leaders last time uh, don't always tend to be the leaders the next year, okay? So, you know, last year we saw a huge outperformance in tech. Um, you know, it's very possible that tech may not be the leader this year, okay? Uh, and, you know, in 2022, we saw things like energy and financials. That was a really bearish time. Um, so, you know, 
you want to de start developing a game plan for investing in 2024 and come up with a couple different thesis, okay, of, you know, what you think uh, the market's going to do uh, and, you know, your, your outlooks on the economy. But before we go any further, the content provided on this channel is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be relied upon as legal, financial, or investment advice. So be sure to read through the disclaimer, okay, guys? I also started a completely free newsletter for you guys called Investment Intelligence, giving out free valuable finance content, free trade ideas every single week. All right. Um, you can take a look at the website. Um, you know, there is a website with it. So it's kind of like a blog as well. But, you know, many of the trade ideas have worked out very well. All right. Teladoc went up over 14 percent after the newsletter. Uh, PayPal went up over 10 percent after the newsletter. Rivian went up over 40 percent after the newsletter. Uh, so, you know. It's more about quality over quantity with me. So you don't ever have to worry about me spamming your inbox, sending you five to 10 different emails every single day, um, you know, trying to brag about one or two that hit, all right? The most recent one was RTX. This is Raytheon. Uh, you can see people hitting me up in the Discord talking about their January call options went up 88%. Uh, they actually ended up going up much past that, hitting 130% uh, at the peaks. All right. Uh, and so if you do want to join the Discord, you can actually get into the Investment Intelligence Discord now uh, for the month of January for just a dollar. Right. So you can get in for just a dollar using promo code JAN24. Uh, that will get you guys a nice discount. Uh, and then after that, it's only ten dollars a month. So you can sign up for the newsletter for free or you can get into the Discord for a dollar right now. In the Discord is where you get access to all the different trade ideas, all the different analysis rather than just, you know, one a week from the newsletter, for instance. Now, what we've got here is basically a chart, um, you know, something that I've scripted to basically model the economic and business cycles, right? Now, what are those you may be asking, right? You can see stock market and economic cycles. Um, you know, you can see here that uh, around an early bear market, you see healthcare, consumer, non-cyclicals uh, really starting to outperform here. Um, you know, you can see the periods of expansion and contraction, Right? And you have bonds and stocks down here, bond stocks, commodities down here, uh, you know, different things like that. OK, so, um, you know, this is another really good one right here. If you want to take a screenshot of this one, basically I have expansion, slowdown, recession, recovery. And it tells you what typically does good, what sectors typically do good. Now, remember, it's not something to live or die by. Um, but, you know, just based on historically, these are you know, kind of what happens uh, in these sectors and in these areas. And you see our red line right here is outperforming. Okay. So, you know, red line is contraction. Okay. That's a very nice way of putting recession. Okay. Um, you know, according to a lot of those business model and, you know, economic uh, cycle charts, this is a little bit concerning for me. Okay. Now it could just be the market, um, you know, going defensive, okay, and in and, and having a shorter term uh, defensive segment, right, and going a little bit more defensive. But when you take a look at the expansion model right here, okay, expansion is green, peak is in blue, right, and then recovery is in yellow here. And again, contraction is the one that's outperforming right now, that's been ripping and continuing its uptrend uh, while the others are starting to roll over a little bit, right? You notice how the peak comes before contraction. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of signs here of expansion and recovery, you know, coming down, right? And these are your, a little bit more of your bullish times. A peak remained flat in this area and then contraction, uh, you know, remained bullish. So something a little bit concerning there uh, to, you know, just... Keep in, in watch and see how this develops. This could be an early sign uh, that the market is pricing in basically some type of contraction in the economy for 2024. Uh, we'll have to see if that's the case or not. Uh, it's still very, very early in the year, uh, but it's interesting to see how that's been developing. Now, what we've got here is really, really great. Um, so this is the EPR model. Okay, This is uh, employment population ratio. Um, you know, you've got basically the things that factor the model, but it's all really about the EPR score down here. And essentially, the employment population ratio model is really just a you know, recession indicator. OK. Um, and, you know, what I really liked about it was that, you know, we did not have a recession last year. OK. Yes, there was a very strong pullback. Some people would argue there was a recession, but, you know. A lot of people basically said there was no recession last year. And look what happened. The EPR model, the score, the EPR score stayed green right here. It stayed at three. So in this environment, 
this is a good investing environment, right? And you typically will see stocks going up. Now, when it shifts to yellow, all right, that's basically a warning that, hey, we're about to get a recession, right? And you see it shifts to yellow right over here. And then we go to red, that's recession, okay? And you can see how things perform during that time period. And this is something that only updates monthly. Uh, so, you know, I typically look at this once, maybe twice a month, um, but it's still green for now. OK, so, you know, even though we are seeing, um, you know, the markets uh, from a performance aspect, right, starting to move into the contraction phase, um, you know, in, in performance wise and in, in what's going up um, at the moment, we still are seeing, you know, a, a solid EPR score here. Um, and, you know, it doesn't look like we're going to have a recession yet. Now, when this shifts yellow. It's going to be a big warning sign for us, okay? And I'll definitely be covering that for you guys. Now, I have an entire video dedicated to uh, this, you know, script, basically, that I put into Think or Swim and the employment population ratio. Uh, feel free to check that out. You can just type in Zachary Trades, um, you know, EPR, employment population ratio. Now, <clears throat> the dollar is going to be very important, okay? Um, you know, I've covered the dollar many times. I've got video, plenty of videos on it. Now, if the dollar goes up, right, stocks typically are going to be going down. Look at this range where we're at right here, okay? We're at a very key level, all right? And I know that phrase and that term is overused, but it's very true at the moment. So if we flush through here, okay, which today, it looks like we're trying to flush through that, right? We didn't see, you know, a huge tank in the dollar today, but the dollar did drop lower, that's going to be good for stocks, okay? That's going to be bullish for stocks and equities. But we're also at a range here where we could have a little oopsie, right? And so, you know, an oopsie would be basically a look below and fail, and then we actually start to rally, okay? Uh, if we do that, that is going to be a headwind for stocks and, you know, not really going to be a great look. So, you know, you do want to pay lots of attention to the dollar right now uh, and, you know, as I mentioned, it's at some pretty key levels, pretty critical levels right here. Old resistance, old resistance becomes new support. And, you know, you can see how much we've really tested this level. Uh, the liquidity is going to break there, right? Either we're going to create a demand imbalance that finally pushes it up because there's no more sellers uh, after testing this area, testing this level so much, or, you know, mm, supply is just going to take over and there's not going to be enough demand in the dollar uh, to really stop it from dropping. Now, this is the MAGS, uh, the Magnificent 7. The MAGS is an ETF. It's an actual uh, Magnificent 7 ETF. Uh, and this thing doesn't look great, right? Um, you know, <clears throat> if we were to take a look at this and we talked about how, you know, typically the things that outperformed uh, in the prior year aren't necessarily going to always be the outperformers in the next year, right? And, you know, what we're looking at is the mags again, the Magnificent Seven, all right, which is basically going to be big tech. Um, these are the big stocks that everyone's paying attention to. This is a ratio chart of the mags divided by the SPY. Uh, and you can see here recently, you know, the Magnificent Seven have not been outperforming the S&P 500, um, you know, through that entire bullish time, right? If we were to just draw, you know, a little vertical line right here, so it's a little bit easier for you guys to see. Okay, so since October, which the stock market bottomed recently in October and had a tremendous rally, you know, it didn't go any higher, right? It, it wasn't able to uh, create a very strong uptrend through that period. And it's basically just showing you that, hey, rather than breaking out past those levels and creating new highs on this ratio chart, you can see it's actually been in more of a downtrend here recently, showing weakness in the Magnificent Seven stocks, which were uh, the big leaders in 2023. Now, this is your equal weight RSP uh, divided by the SPY. This is another ratio chart here. And, you know, <clears throat> the equal weight has been performing pretty well. Okay. Uh, you can see, you know, some key levels over here, key levels here, very strong bounce. Uh, your RSI also had a nice little bullish divergence in this period here, where it's putting in a nice Kardashian bottom. Uh, you can see that there's higher lows there. And here you can see that in this period where we're making lower lows, right? A low and a lower low, we're making a low and actually a higher low here. Uh, that's a nice bullish divergence. We saw a very nice bounce, uh, but it came up into resistance there. Old support here became new resistance. And the thing that most people don't seem to understand um, is that, you know, seeing the equal weight index outperform the S&P 500 is not bullish guys. Okay. At the end of the day, like people complain about 
you know, the big tech stocks and, you know, all the big names carrying all the weight in the S&P 500. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, when you see those leading the way, right, and, and you see the market going up, uh, it's for a reason, right? And oftentimes when you see the RSP outperforming the S&P 500, it's actually bearish for the stock market, right? And it's actually bearish for the S&P 500. Uh, and the reason being is because if you take a look, it's vastly underweight information technology, okay? Now it's overweight, things like industrials, okay? So that RSP outperforming means that things like the Dow Jones Industrials, DIA is doing pretty good, maybe XLI is doing pretty good, uh, but you also see here real estate, utilities, materials, energy, you know, these, these areas here that really don't hold much significance or much weight in the S&P 500, um, you know, these are a lot larger here, uh, but again, it's really mostly just because the RSP, the equal weight is vastly underweight, um, you know, information technology compared to the SPY. Okay. And so, you know, if that's not performing well, and that's not doing good, um, you know, then it, typically it's not going to be doing, it's not good for the stock market either. You have to keep that in mind. Now, some things that do look good are small caps. Okay. And I think small caps have a lot of potential in the year uh, moving forward. And it's really just about timing, uh, you know, you know, you can't time the market, but you necessarily, you know, you also don't want to buy highs, right? So, you know, I'll be looking and waiting patiently for, uh, you know, some dips, a pullback correction in the stock market. Uh, and, you know, when that time occurs, I think that small caps uh, will be really interesting, right? You know, we've got the RSP divided by SPY right here in blue. All right. So this is kind of that same chart that we were just looking at on a different time frame. Uh, and then we've got IWM divided by IWB. This is your small caps versus large caps. Um, and, you know, it looks pretty good for me. All right. Now it did have an extremely large move uh, to the upside here recently through November and December, and we're getting a correction here. Uh, but I think there's lots of potential. Now industrials, right? We talked about the RSP outperforming, right? This is XLI over XLK. This looks like it's trying to bottom here. Okay. It doesn't have, um, you know, the big par dash in bottom here, but it's got a smaller one here and it looks like it's got some potential to move to the upside. And again, with these ratio charts, um, you know, the ticker symbol in front just means that those are outperforming the ticker symbol behind them, um, you know, whenever this chart is going up. So, um, you know, if something like the RSP is going to continue to outperform the SPY, all right, um, then it's very possible that, you know, this ratio chart here continues to increase and we actually see industrials do pretty well. So, you know, think of some industrial stocks that you may want to look at, right? Maybe Caterpillar, uh, for instance, is just one to, I'm, I'm throwing out there, right? Now, you do want to beware OPEX, uh, OPEX, okay? Now, OPEX is options expiration dates. Um, the 10 worst weeks of the S&P 500, um, many of them were after OPEX, okay? Option expiration dates. So, um, you know, I just thought that that's really, really interesting. And it just kind of goes to show that um, there's a lot happening in the options market that influences the actual stock market itself. Okay, so what I mean by that is, you know, think about if you have a bunch of call options, right? Those are those are bets that the stock market is going to go up and you have them for the option expiration week, which is, you know, right around the third Friday of every month, right? And so let's say, you know, you buy them in the beginning of the month, right? And the market moves up. And when it's time for expiration to come, you know, a large portion, you know, basically most of all options uh, never get executed, right? And so what we mean by that is people are just simply buying and selling these instruments and not really uh, holding them through expiration all the time and executing them. And so let's say you buy something in the beginning of the month with the OPEX, uh, with the options expiration date, okay? And then, you know, it moves forward in your favor and it rallies and then you sell, right? Because you don't want to hold that option, right? So now on the Friday expiration date, you know, rather than holding that option anymore, now you're selling, right? And if there's tons and tons and tons of people, institutions, hedge funds, um, and, and, and things like that, doing the same type of thing, where now they're taking off that leverage, okay, because options are basically just a form of leverage to, um, you know, execute your opinion on a stock. You know, it's it's much more leveraged than just buying or selling shares. Um, you know, that leverage rolls off now, and now that becomes out of the market. And so market makers, whenever people are buying uh, options or selling options, market makers typically tend to hedge against that, right? And so uh, those are things that cause stuff like gamma squeeze and, you know, many other things. But, 
you know, I just think it's really interesting, but it also makes a lot of sense that, you know, a lot of the worst weeks that we saw in the S&P 500 were right after OPEC's expiration date. So that means that that Friday, a bunch of those contracts were going to expire, a bunch of them got sold off. And now that gamma pressure that was on the market previously uh, is now off, right? And it all kind of gets dumped off at once. And the next week, we kind of see a little bit of a sell-off afterwards as a result uh, from that weakened gamma pressure. Now, that's pretty much going to wrap up today's video. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter, Investment Intelligence, using the link in the description. Get those free trade ideas, free valuable content every single week directly to your inbox. And um, I'd really love if you guys would join the Discord. Okay, I'm trying to, you know, basically make it as cheap as possible right now. You know, you can get in for a dollar. Promo code Jan24. I'm doing that to uh, try to get new members in there uh, and really just grow it. Uh, so that way you guys can all be a part and see, you know, what it is that I'm actually looking at on a day to day basis, the different stocks that I'm looking at, the different stocks I'm trading. Uh, you also get access to uh, many valuable resources. Um, you know, I have custom scripts, indicators and things like that inside of the discord as well. Um, so hopefully I'll see you guys in there. Promo code Jan24 will get you guys in for just a dollar, basically to celebrate the new year and uh, hopefully get things going on the right track for you.